Thank you, Ashton. Um, good morning, good afternoon to everybody, and welcome to our first Resilience Measurement Evidence and Learning Community of Practice webinar. Um, we're really pleased this, this today to, to start this webinar series, which is an opportunity for our members to share their research, their measurement frameworks, evidence and learning in the resilience measurement and uh, monitoring and evaluation field. It's also an opportunity to start to explore together some of the, the challenges that we um, have started talking about in the community of practice during the convenings in 2016 and 2017. And I'm really pleased that we're focusing this particular webinar on, on questions of, of data and measurement across scales, and also the, the, the sort of interaction between different systems, social systems and um, ecological systems. These are two uh, themes that we talked about extensively during the convenings as, as open spaces in terms of resilience measurement, evidence and learning. Um, I'm excited today and, and really want to say thank you to our speakers to introduce um, Angelica Ospina from the International Institute of Social Sustainable Development. And Angelica has been a very active member of the community of practice since we started the, the conversations in 2016. She's joined today by her colleague from IISD, uh, a geographer, Jeffrey Gunn. And they will be setting the scene in terms of thinking about data and resilience and key opportunities and challenges and emerging research opportunities um, in this arena. And they will be followed by two colleagues from Conservation International. We have Alex Zoleff, who's the Director of Data Science in the Moore Center for Science at Con Conservation International. And he's joined by his colleague, Monica Noon, who is a Geogra Geographic Information Science Manager across two projects with Conservation International Vital Signs and the Resilience Atlas, which Alex and, and Monica will be talking about. So without further ado, I'm gonna stop there and invite Angelica to start the webinar. And as Ashton said, we'll take questions in the chat box and Angelica will help us to wrap up the end with some, with some ideas about next steps. Thank you so much, Dorcas. I am in the process of sharing my screen. Very good. So thank you again uh, for this invitation and good morning and good afternoon to all of our participants. As Dorcas mentioned, I'm a senior researcher for the Resilience Program at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, IISD. I'm based in Ottawa, Canada, and I'm delighted to participate in this first webinar along with my colleague, Jeff Gunn, who's based in Winnipeg. So we're very excited also to share with you a new initiative called Big Data Better Resilience, which is led by ISD. And in this initiative, we're collaborating uh, with a number of organizations that are members of the community on practi of practice of resilience measurement and learning. And we're hoping to expand it to other organizations that are interested in or that are already working on the intersection of big data and resilience. So we're going to start with a few introductory remarks about ISD and about the concept and the relevance of big data. And we are then going to tell you more about the Big Data for Resilience initiative, highlighting some of the key opportunities and challenges in, in, in this field. And we are going to be ending the presentation, highlighting some emerging research um, themes and proposing concrete steps and opportunities for involvement for, both, for those of you that are interested in, in hearing more about it and working with us in this field. So with this, I will hand it off uh, to Jeff. Great, thanks Angelica. We'll go to the next slide. So I'll just introduce ISD briefly. We're an independent organization. Uh, we're a nonprofit uh, based here in Winnipeg, Canada. Uh, we were established in 1990 by the government at the time in the, you know, in the run up to Rio. Our mission really is to think um, holistically about sustainable development around the world. We look at the science that leads us to better decision making. We look at uh, human resilience, we look at all sorts of things to help uh, you know, guide a pragmatic approach. We have 120 full-time staff, as you can see, and a network that really ranges around the world of about 100 associates. Uh, as we mentioned, I'm based here in Winnipeg at the center of North America. Uh, we have offices elsewhere in Ottawa, Geneva, and New York. And what really makes us tick is our partnerships. Next. So we have uh, diverse areas of practice throughout 
an economic law and policy, water resilience, knowledge, all sorts of things. We, we employ a diverse group of people ranging from policy analysts, uh, hard physical scientists, biologists, ecologists, lawyers, uh, really a whole gamut of, of experts to, to solve some of the problems facing the world today. Next. So to get into our talk today, we're, we're going to discuss big data. Um, the Economist this uh, spring in May said that data are to this century what oil was to the last one, a driver of growth and change. This sentiment has been echoed by Wired and all sorts of publications around the world, and it's, it's starting to be adopted within uh, communities of practice throughout data science, uh, technology, and even into the physical sciences. So when we have a problem today, we'll start this off by thinking about what you do when you, when you've, uh, when you have something wrong with you. You go to your Google and you check it out. Uh, click, please. So in 2009, uh, this started to be recognized. People would, would type in when they start to feel ill, well, what are flu, flu symptoms? Do I have the flu? Do I have a cold? Uh, you know, what's going on with me? So if we go to the next slide, we'll see that this was harnessed successfully by a group of people, uh, both Google and community health practitioners, to begin looking at where non-seasonal flus would happen. And this was harnessing the big data of millions or billions of Google searches. This allowed people to identify where problems would start to happen, both geographically and temporally, both in space and in time and really provided an early warning system for public health practitioners. Uh, later validation confirmed that this is, uh, is a, an appropriate method to use, and it you know, avoids some of the issues you would see with uh, personal health information and accessing records across jurisdictions. It's really becoming clear that this torrent of big data, this flood that's happening, can be harnessed for good. So we have some uh, points here on where this data will come from. Google is an obvious example. It's something that we all are feeding into. We're, we're using it, we're getting a service, and in, in turn, they're collecting some of our data. There's other ways too. We have a growing internet of things. Uh, everything that's web connected around the world, our mobile phones, whether we use even uh, credit or debit cards, all of that is passively feeding into big, big data collection systems. There's also more physical sensors around the world than we've ever had before, and these are almost entirely web-connected. Within cities, these are traffic cameras, even traffic lights, uh, satellites orbiting the Earth, collecting petabytes of data every year, uh, global positioning systems, weather sensors, uh, all sorts of monitors. And then as I've discussed, we all contribute into this system. Uh, click ahead. We're all putting data in at a faster and faster rate, it's also being recorded and analyzed at a faster rate. So definitions of big data inc inc incorporate the three Vs, velocity, variety, and volume. Volume is the most apparent. It's when our hard drive fills up, we have gigabytes or terabytes of our own pictures or data. But in, in other ways, big data includes variety, more unstructured data, more difficult to analyze traditionally. It's also in the real time or near real time uh, time scales. It really is a torrent, it's flooding us. And big data has become popular as a term because it's not something you, you can analyze in a traditional way, as a, especially from my background as a scientist. However, if we move to the next slide, we'll see that some areas of science have already been handling this issue. Um, some groups such as uh, the European Commission and uh, or even academics such as Matthew Hansen have shown us that we can harness big satellite data to actually make products that are useful for making better decisions. What we see here in the, in the thing in front of you is global forest change. It's loss of forest over the last 17 years across the world. Uh, in the top left, we see global population, uh, a map of global population, something that lets us take both remotely sensed data from satellites and you know, the data produced by countries and institutions and put it all together, put it to a common projection and use it to do some good. We'll skip, we'll click the next one. So this helps us make better decisions. It helps us observe our world. And what we need to do is start to take it outside of these areas that traditionally can handle it, like remote sensing, earth observation, move it to other areas. Next slide. I found this great quote in a, in a discussion of big data in the future of ecology by Hampton. 
that ecologists collectively produce large volumes of data but lack a culture of data curation and sharing. I know and there's, there's many disciplines that have this. They're not as you know, naturally outfitted with the tools of data science to the same extent, or they don't have that tradition of curation and sharing. So this is an area that we're, we're very interested in, particularly at ISD, because we've just taken over operation of the experimental Deloix area, which itself has collected a tremendous amount of data over the past 50 years as part of long-term ecosystem research. What we need to do is start to move some of these areas, uh, especially in terms of resilience, in terms of ecology, and in terms of our societies, into being, being able to better handle these big data to make better decisions. And with that, I'll move it over to Angelica. So data is increasingly becoming a real-time decision-making tool, and the emergence of new kinds of data about human behaviors and beliefs that are generated and collected by digital devices and services have also led us to the acknowledgement of a set of important differences. We know that increasing availability of data doesn't necessarily equal better information, better monitoring systems, knowledge, or actions. And we know as well that more data doesn't always mean better decisions and bigger data does not necessarily translate into bigger resilience. So we really need to unpack the linkages that exist between big data, resilience programming, and particularly its role in measurement and learning from change. And this is precisely a context within which the Big Data for Resilience initiative emerged at ISD uh, earlier this year. It is important to mention that this initiative builds upon the body of work and experiences that already exist in the field of big data development and humanitarian assistance, including initiatives such as the UN Global Pulse and important resources such as the work done by Michael Bamberger with the support of the Rockefeller Foundation on the integration of big data into the m &E of development programs. So the Big Data for Resilience initiative uh, applies a novel resilience lens to understand the role of big data in processes of resilience building. The research explores the limitations, the risks, and the opportunities of using big data to build resilience and identify some of the key implications for both policymakers and development practitioners. And one of the key questions that we asked ourselves when we started exploring these linkages was precisely how to avoid the jargon about the big data and actually find a robust conceptual and practical sense of its role in processes of resilience building. And that is what led us to the development of the Big Data for Resilience conceptual framework, which is still in its draft form, and we would like to test it further and refine it in collaboration with you. So the main focus of the conceptual framework is the analysis of the linkages that exist between big data and a set of key resilience attributes that ultimately contribute to the ability of vulnerable systems to cope with, adapt, and potentially transform in the face of shocks and stressors. So here's the set of resilience attributes um, that we selected linked to some examples of big data. Just to mention that these attributes were identified as part of previous work on e-resilience and the role of information and communication technologies in processes of resilience building uh, that was undertaken at the University of Manchester in England. The examples were drawn from the work of the UN Data Pulse Initiative. So just to mention a few, for example, um, social media monitoring can provide us with real-time information on victim location, effects, and strength of hazards, which improves the rapidity of disaster responses and can help inform self-organization efforts at the local level. For example, tracking patterns of financial transactions via mobile phones can provide us data on remittances and give us an indication of the redundancy of resources as well as the scale of community networks, all of which are important attributes in processes of resilience building. So there are many projects that are already using big data for development purposes, including increasingly in the field of disaster preparedness and response. But the key here is to analyze and to um, explore more in depth the way in which that data is contributing or not to build and particularly to inform resilience actions in vulnerable systems. In other words, the ability of those systems to cope with, adapt, and transform. So this is the Big Data for Resilience Framework. Uh, we won't have enough time to go in depth into its components, but, uh, but I do encourage those of you that are interested in this conceptual approach to contact us uh, in order to discuss it further. 
particularly if you are interested in, in the possibility of testing it and working with us uh, in refining a, this conceptual approach, including um, understanding a bit more about both the intended and the unintended functions of big data and the way in which big data can or not contribute to those different attributes that I mentioned before. So these are some of the research questions that we are exploring at the moment uh, as part of our initiative and that we're hoping to contribute uh, further to, to a learning and research agenda in this field. Uh, we're exploring how can big data um, tell us something new about resilience pathways and what could be its main contributions and limitations for practitioners, how to use big data in order to enable the ability of both uh, not only to bounce back but to leap forward from impacts of sensors and how to leverage uh, both the intended, potentially unintended functions of big data uh, for resilience in processes of policy and development planning and implementation. And of course, uh, of particular interest to the community of practice, what are the implications uh, for resilience measurement practitioners of the use of big data? There's a whole bunch of interesting activities that, that we wanted to briefly share with us. And again, we are very interested in finding new partnerships. We are already working with Conservation International, with the UN Data Pulse, and with CER Consortium on some of these products. We're working on a case study of the nexus between big data, resilience, and water resources uh, based on a ISD experimental lakes area. So here we're exploring some of those attributes that I mentioned before and the role of big data from an ecosystem perspective, which is uh, something uh, very interesting. We're also looking for uh, new partnerships and the possibility of testing the big data for resilience framework in order to again refining and see uh, it's useful. Uh, we're working on a set of uh, policy and practice recommendations for the use of big data for resilience building, uh, an infographic, and again, in collaboration with other organizations, uh, we are preparing a big data for resilience publication uh, that will compile practical experiences uh, integrating big data into resilience programming. And uh, if you have an experience or know of an organization that would be interested in collaborating with us in this publication, uh, we'll be delighted to hear from you. Again, uh, we acknowledge the fact that partnerships in this field are key and look forward to, to working on, on, on building a more partnerships uh, with other organizations. Of course, the relevance of the big data lens is that um, it allows us to see and to understand relationships within and among pieces of information that until recently we struggled to fully grasp. And it can allow resilience practitioners and particularly resilience measurement practitioners to identify novel patterns of information and inference in the ability of vulnerable systems to cope with, adapt, and potentially transform. And these are some of the opportunities that we have identified um, Again, strengthening resilience programming and measurement and deepening resilience learning in order to use the digital footprint, uh, not only to monitor, but really to understand and learn from change. Uh, we are exploring, of course, new entry points into such ecological systems resilience um, and developing innovative approaches, tools, and partnerships. Uh, but of course, a key part of this exploration is to map and better understand the limitations and challenges of using big data as part of resilience programming. Uh, most of these these challenges and limitations have been already identified in existing literature, so I won't go into them, but I will mention a few. Uh, among them, we have uh, challenges related to methodological uh, issues of data management, human and technological gaps, uh, especially among institutions of the global south that, that lack certain capacities needed to really benefit from the potential of the data infrastructure and resources, uh, the tool to gather uh, these are uh, tend to be difficult to use and expensive. We have also institutional uh, cultural limitations, privacy um, and security issues, and the importance of ensuring that uh, our work with big data is, is uh, actually actionable and replicable in practice. 
events. So just to wrap up uh, our presentation, these are some of the emerging uh, research issues that are constantly evolving and that involve issues related to strength and resilience measurement and programming, uh, issues related, of course, with scale, participation, transparency, speed prediction and response capacity of vulnerable systems and ecosystems, um, at the intersection of big data and resilience, the identification of both gaps and limitations that need to be addressed and opportunities that could be tackled by practitioners to really benefit from the big data revolution and the exploration of new policy linkages and, and private sector involvement and partnerships in order to, to uh, further benefit from this. So with this I will, uh, among other issues of course, so with this I will end. Uh, we wanted to discuss with you um, some of uh, the concrete opportunities to work together in this field and concrete opportunities to partner in this field. Uh, and we can discuss this a bit further, but the intention here, and there's a lot of interest in forming a big data resilience measurement working group. Uh, to continue exploring this issue. Uh, we are again looking for partners for the Big Data for Resilience publication and a launch event that we expect to do early in 2017 and to, uh, opportunities to pilot together uh, the Big Data for Resilience conceptual. So with this, I will finish. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Angelica. That was great. And so I'm going to invite um, Alex and Monica to go ahead and, and follow up with the discussion. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alex Wallace. Uh, thank you for the uh, uh, excellent presentation, Angelica and uh, Jeff. I think our work ties very closely together here, so we're excited to be here. And we want to thank the community of practice, of course, for the uh, opportunity to participate. So I'm going to talk with my uh, colleague Monica Noon about a tool that we've developed that uh, basically to integrate data sets uh, around the topic of resilience. My name is Alex Wallace. I'm director of data science here uh, at Conservation International uh, and my colleague Monica Noon will uh, be speaking in a moment uh, in a bit more detail about uh, how we can actually use this tool to derive insights. Uh, so again, I don't need to go into this too much uh, detail for this group here. I think everybody recognizes the challenge, oops, I'm seeing some chats here, recognizes the challenge uh, of resilience. Uh, but particularly for us here at Conservation International, much of our work centers around rural livelihoods. And the challenge that these communities face really was brought home in the El Nino of 2015 to 2016, uh, where we saw global climate trends impacting the food security of more than 60 million people. Uh, around the world. And so we have programs all around the world uh, work active in Eastern Africa and Southern Africa. Uh, more than 40 million people were projected to be food insecure as a result of the El Nino of 2015 to 2016 in uh, Southern Africa and uh, more than 10 million people required food assistance uh, in Ethiopia. And of course events like these are likely to become more frequent with climate change which really brings home uh, the great need to bring to bear the data that we have so that we can try to understand uh, a bit more about the resilience of these communities. Uh, so as Angelica and uh, Jeff already said, the challenge really here is that data is needed, needed uh, not just data, but the right data and at the right scale to respond to these resilience challenges. So data in and of itself, of course, is not information. The challenge is really how do we bring together the broad variety of data sets that are available, for example, the global forest change data set that Jeff mentioned and the surface water data sets, uh, to how do we really bring these together in a way in which they can actually inform uh, investments that are being made by the global community right now uh, in these areas. So I don't need to belabor this point most likely with this community, but I do think it's useful just to talk a bit about definitions before we go into the tool. Uh, there are many frameworks out there. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor here, but there's many frameworks out there uh, for understanding resilience. What I'm borrowing from here is the one you see at the bottom of the screen, uh, the Resilience Adaptation Pathways and Transformation Assessment Framework, or RAPTA. Uh, and so it's useful to think of three different concepts when we're talking here about this broader topic of resilience. Uh, so first, of course, is resilience itself, which we uh, define as the ability of a socio-ecological system to withstand, respond to, and adapt to stresses and shocks. Adaptation, then, is a process of change that enables a system to weather these stresses or shocks uh, while maintaining its identity. And then of key interest here as well is then the topic and concept of transformation. 
which is the shift from a current system to a new and different one. For example, uh, in the context of our work, this could be a transition from uh, cropping to pastoralism or vice versa. And it's important to remember that uh, we adopt really a value neutral approach. So resilience, of course, can be desirable or undesirable depending on the context. For example, uh, woody encroachment could be a, a very, uh, lead to a very resilient ecosystem in which uh, uh, former grasslands are dominated by woody plants, but this could be something that's desirable or undesirable uh, depending on the intended use of that land. So then the question here today is really, how can data drive response? How can we bring to bear some of the data sets that have come out of uh, the development, the scientific, the uh, conservation, the NGO worlds, in order to inform uh, our work and, and understand how we can build resistance, sorry, build resistance, build resilience, uh, or uh, understand where our areas where uh, something like transformation might be more appropriate. So what we've done is we've developed a tool called the Resilience Atlas. Uh, this is showing you the homepage of the Resilience Atlas. It's just resilienceatlas.org. Uh, so this is online now. And the idea of the Resilience Atlas was really to bring together data sets that uh, previously were available only to specific areas or segments uh, of the academic community or of the uh, development worlds. Uh, so for example, the global forest change data set that was mentioned earlier, we include in here, as well as uh, the surface water data set that was mentioned earlier here. So what the idea is, is really to bring the, the, these data sets in a single place for somebody who may not be uh, uh, that familiar with uh, current trends in the world of big data, who may not be a geographic information systems or remote sensing specialist, bring them together in a single tool where they can be overlaid and analyzed in a way that's uh, far more accessible than they have been previously. So it may be hard to see on your screen here, but what we've done is organize uh, some of these data sets are around three different broad topics. So the first that you'll see at the top of your screen here is livelihoods, production systems, and ecosystems. And the idea is that you can then choose a particular system and then understand what are the different stressors and shocks, uh, the second topic that you see here, uh, this particular system might be exposed to. And then thirdly, we have this category of factors influencing vulnerability, the idea being that you can then understand, given a particular system and an ex exposure to stressors and shocks, what are some of the different uh, factors that may be leverage points where, for example, a, a large group like bank, uh, like Conservation International, uh, might make investments in order to uh, impact the resilience of a system. So this uh, screenshot here is just showing you an example of this tool uh, with two data sets in Madagascar. One is a population data set put together by uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratories. Second is a tropical cyclone frequency data set. Monica will be going into a bit more detail about some of the work we've done in Madagascar at the moment. Uh, but as you can see here, it's fairly easy and accessible for a user, uh, even if they may not be familiar with uh, big data, to work with data sets that can be many times, many gigabytes in size. Uh, so the idea really was to make these data sets available in such a way that they're far more accessible than they have been uh, in the past. Another uh, uh, key component of the tool that I show here is the journeys. And what we found is as we worked with this tool with practitioners, uh, we quickly came to understand that uh, though things like uh, GIS overlays and different types of analyses that uh, may be familiar to uh, someone like Monica or Angelica or Jeff here, uh, there are certainly those who could uh, benefit from a bit more of a guided uh, approach through the data sets. So basically what the journeys are is they show sort of a step-by-step -step process uh, around a particular topic, how someone might work with these data sets in this tool to try and understand some aspect uh, of resilience. And again, Monica will go into a bit more detail in a moment about this type of process and some of the work that we've done in Madagascar. Just a couple examples of how this tool has been used. Uh, this example is actually online, intensification.resilienceatlas.org. Uh, this is still a beta version here, but this is online, so you can feel free to go to that page to view it. What you're seeing here is uh, an analysis that we've conducted using some of these data sets uh, to try and inform investments in agricultural intensification uh, here in Uganda, Tanzania, and Rwanda. Uh, so what you see here on the left side are three different scenarios of how investments might be made, and then the color coding is showing uh, what the resultant uh, suitability of land might be for, uh, this is focusing on maize. The tool's also been used within the Global Resilience Partnership, which was actually the initial uh, donation that led to the formation of this tool. So the Global Resilience Partnership really came to us saying, we're making these investments 
all over the world? Is there some way that you can bring together the best available data sets around resilience uh, in a single tool to inform our investments? So it's shown here are some of the project locations for the uh, Global Resilience Partnership, which is a, a joint investment originally of Rockefeller Foundation, USAID, and CETA. And so this tool has been used by them to try and understand uh, what are the trends and the various stressors and shocks in their project locations, and what are some of the different factors uh, that their projects may focus on in order to build resilience of particular communities. It's also been used within the Vital Science Project, which is a, a project of Conservation International. So this is a project centered on uh, rural livelihoods, ecosystems, uh, and climate change. And so what's shown here is uh, some of the work that we've done in Uganda, and this is showing uh, access to markets. Uh, and of course, as you see on the left, there's a broad range of data sets that you can use uh, to try and understand uh, different trends in that area. I'll hand it over now to my colleague Monica Noon, and she'll go into a bit more detail about uh, some of the analyses. All right, thank you, Alex. Um, now, as Alex mentioned, we've um, highlighted his particular journeys to walk people through how we've analyzed the data around a particular question. Um, I'm just going to step through uh, the process of deriving insights using the Atlas. Um, so basically the, the use of the Atlas enables non-technical users to perform basic analysis and derive their own insights. Um, it allows us to directly engage with stakeholders to meet their data needs. Um, and it's proven a very successful platform for discussing um, various, you know, large big data um, factors in, in workshops. So we can ask questions, for example, like, where is irrigation dependent rice production most at risk to climate stressors and shocks in Madagascar? So starting with that top category on the Resilience Atlas, um, livelihoods and production systems, we can identify where rice is grown in Madagascar. Um, this layer on the right shows the percent of land cover that's under cultivation of rice which within each region of, of Madagascar. Now we have a CI office in Madagascar, so we were able to get data locally um, for the country specifically. Um, we see in the central and eastern parts of the country, there's higher percentage of rice cultivation in this red and orange colors. We can also move on to look at uh, the climate stressors that may be impacting um, successful rice production. Um, so if we look um, on the right, the map shows uh, changes in rainfall from the historic mean. It's an average of 30 years of rainfall data. Um, and it was modeled using the uh, RCP 8.5, or the most extreme of the four greenhouse gas concentration trajectories um, adopted by the IPCC. Um, so it's a line in red uh, on the graph on the left. So we can see that there's declining precipitation in the same areas where higher cultivation of rice exists in Madagascar. And we can also go to the third category to determine um, who may actually be vulnerable um, in the country. So we examined and plotted percent studying in children as a proxy for health or nutrition. Um, by overlaying these layers, we're able to spatially identify locations where high rice production is not reflected in high nutrition outcomes. Um, we can also compare this with climate stressors to determine how health can be impacted. So in other words, where we see declining rainfall, we're also seeing an increase in stunting. The freshwater areas important for rice irrigation were identified through uh, a natural capital accounting project at Conservation International um, to determine which upstream water resources uh, are in need of restoration or preservation to maintain water for irrigation for this staple crop. So you see these areas in purple. By overlaying that with, uh, for example, the projected rainfall changes, um, we can determine which regions are most vulnerable to declining rainfall with higher areas of important freshwater resources. So from this plot, we see the regions with the highest area needed for freshwater rice irrigation have the highest potential decline in projected rainfall. Um, now these plates, uh, points are weighted by population size of each region, so you can also identify which regions have the highest population which may be vulnerable. So in Madagascar, we use this um, by linking the Resilience Atlas to ecosystem-based adaptation work at Conservation International due to similar criteria for identifying EBA projects as identifying um, and deriving insights with the Resilience Atlas. So we've outlined these, these different criteria for EBA projects uh, where the design and implementation must address at least one climate change impact. The activities must include conservation, restoration, and or biodiversity. Um, to help people adapt to climate change. 
and the outcomes must relate to improved livelihoods and or increased resiliency of people to climate change. So for example, in Colombia, they identified that increasing temperatures and decreasing rainfall will impact water availability. So rather than building a dam to hold water for irrigation, we can focus on an overall approach of watershed restoration. Um, this leads to similar outcomes as a man-made solution where availability is protected, yet with the added provision that the water supply is now climate resilient. Um, so we've just walked you through ways that we use the Resilience Atlas to um, identify and prioritize interventions. Um, so for some of the uh, upcoming initiatives that we have using the Resilience Atlas that um, may take a change uh, for a more monitoring approach. Um, we will be using the Resilience Atlas as a primary component of monitoring and assessment framework for the 12 country um, Jeff funded integrated approach pilot on food security. Um, the Resilience Atlas has also contributed in the past, like I, I gave the example in Madagascar, to their national adaptation planning efforts. Um, we'll continue with that um, in South Africa and Indonesia. And we're developing data integration platforms for national level planning and reporting on the SDGs in the future as well. So that is all we have for you from Conservation International. Thank you for your time. All right. So thank you, everyone, for presenting. This is a um, um, fascinating discussion around data. Um, so we'll move on to questions now. Looks like, let's see here. Okay, so we have a couple of questions about whether or not this presentation will be made available. Um, the answer is yes. Um, so I have an audio recording of the entire presentation um, that will be prepared and sent out later today. Um, so you can review that and listen to it. We have one other question, it looks like from Ramu. Um, asked, what kind of partnership are you looking for? Can you be more specific? I'm not sure if that's directed at anyone in particular. I think, Ashlyn, uh, hi, it's Angelica. I think that was directed uh, probably to us, just because we, we made the reference to, to our interest of, of partnerships and finding new collaborators earlier. So I can address it now if, if you want. So that would be great, thank you. Okay, so there's three main points. Thank you so much, Ramo, for the, for the questions. There's three main um, kind of concrete uh, ways in which we are seeking for new partners and collaborations. The first one is uh, the most immediate one. It's in the Big Data for Resilience publication that we are preparing in collaboration with uh, other organizations. So we are looking for experiences uh, of organizations, of not, not for profit organizations or international organizations that are working with big data for resilience building or development programming. So we're interested in identifying their experiences and uh, knowing if those uh, experiences uh, could be highlighted uh, and included as part of our publication, uh, which will be kind of a flip book with um, compelling stories about some of the challenges, the opportunities, and recommendations for practitioners that are uh, working or interested in working in big data uh, for resilience building. So we are looking for experiences and organizations that want to be part of this publication. The second one, uh, we are also looking for organizations that are interested in the conceptual uh, side of things on understanding better conceptually the linkages between big data and resilience. So we would love to be able to um, test the framework that we develop and to refine it further in collaboration with others because we acknowledge the fact that um, the value of conceptual frameworks is precisely whether or not they can be used uh, by practitioners in, you know, in the field and in order to uh, strengthen uh, planning and implementation and m and &E processes. So we, we really want to um, test it and, and, and you know, improve it. And the third area, um, Dorcas um, mentioned at the beginning, the community of practice um, is, is a space for um, like-minded organizations to come together, uh, change um, experiences, and further their knowledge on certain themes. And one of those new themes, of course, uh, is big data for resilience. So we are interested in forming a critical mass of organizations that, that are interested and excited about big data for resilience measurement, and we're interested in, in helping them um, facilitate and, and form a group that can explore these, these issues further. Thank you. So, uh, excuse me, this is Ramu here. Can you hear me? 
Yes. <clears throat> just on your last point, um, just to follow on, um, are you thinking of um, um, creating some kind of technical group or something like that to have a more systematic and continuous discussion on this very important topic going forward? Um, and if, if, if yes, if that's the thinking, um, then um, are there any plans in terms of how you are going to, um, you know, develop such group, such technical, I guess it's, it's more of a voluntary group at this point. Um, and how are we, um, how are you going to, uh, is there, or is there, is there any thoughts at all in terms of how you are going to proceed in terms of reaching, reaching out to the individuals or the organization that might be interested? to be a part of such technical group. Hey, Rama, this is Dorcas. Angelica, maybe I can respond on that in terms of thinking about the work plan of the community of practice. Thanks for that question, Ramu. And I'm encouraging people as I'm talking to post any questions you have in the in the chat box. Yes, Rama, this is very much the, the idea within the community of practice is the development with like-minded organizations who want to lead some conceptual framing, some practical work in, in key uh, thematic areas or key topics. To, to enable those working groups to come together. Um, we've, uh, many of you will have been aware of the open innovation calls that we ran a few months ago. We've had a couple of uh, awards made in the arena of data validation of data and also data for decision making. So we have a couple of really exciting awards that are just starting up now. We also know that there are a lot of other members with, with keen interest in challenges around big data and big data for designing programming, you know, data for resilience assessments, for designing programming, increasingly around monitoring, evaluation and learning. So I think there's a great appetite across the community of practice. This is definitely a big area of potential innovation in terms of informing resilience investments moving forward. So certainly one key next step will be that we will send out an email um, to the members of the community of practice um, and to people who joined this webinar inviting you to let us know if you have a strong interest in, in, in forming some, an initial group around this topic um, and we can discuss some next steps around that when, when we convene that, that group um, in, in, the next, in the coming weeks or so. And I don't know if you want to add on that. No, I think that's perfect, uh, Dorcas. I think that from, from the perspective of, the, of, of my organization, the ISD, one of our um, key interests as well is to come together and um, form jointly or identify jo jointly um, an emerging research and learning agenda around topics at the intersection of resilience, measurement, and big data. So I think this type of working group uh, would be a great space for doing that, and, and we really welcome and, and are very thankful for the support of the community of practice with that, that idea. Yeah, just wanted to very quickly, I uh, won't take to more than one minute. Um, um, but there, there, I, I know that there was a, a technical group. I, I don't know if it is still active. Um, you know, USAID and FAO and I think WFP and the World Bank and some other organization came together and they built up a, a you know, develop a, a, tech, a resilience technical working group at some point. Um, ICF, uh, the organization, where, the company where I work for, uh, you know, where I work, uh, we were keenly following all the activities that, that, that specific technical group was doing, and uh, but we don't we don't hear uh, from that technical group anymore. So I was wondering what what, what was going on with that group. But then maybe that if if that uh, working group if that working group is not active anymore, maybe this 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 thinking that you have right now to create something like that would be would be would be able to take that momentum forward. Um, so just wanted to say that. Thank you, Ramu. Thank you for that. That. Uh, that comment and actually the the members of the technical working group have been very active um, in the development of the resilience male community of practice and we we have complementary pieces of work um, coming together so we can certainly um, provide updates on that uh, through the community of practice in the coming months um, just to let you know that they are still meaning and developing work together um, 
thanks for your inputs. Those were really useful. So I've, I've got a question here from Chris McConnell. And Chris is asking, can the panel give us an example of where big data has been used to increase resilience? And what was their evidence of improvement? And I think we're getting to the nub here of, of the big challenges, right? Um, who, who'd like to answer that question or respond to that? Yeah, definitely. Excellent question. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's the million dollar question, in fact. <laughs> so as far as our work, uh, so we don't have a clear example yet of where uh, big data has increased resilience, uh, primarily given we haven't had enough time to see the effects in the systems in which we're working. Uh, so for example, some of the work that we've done in Madagascar to inform their national adaptation plans, we would expect to see increases in resilience, for example, in some of our fisheries work and uh, increased ability of fish harvests, for example, but we don't have uh, at this point enough data and a long enough time series to really see that evidence of improvement. Um, one example where I think we could get closer to this in the future is our work that we're doing uh, right now in a global environment facility funded project on food security. That's a longer duration. Right now we're just starting that project when we have some of the tools and frameworks already together that we can use to try to better uh, measure changes in resilience. But again, uh, that project has not been in effect long enough for us to able, be able to actually detect those changes. I can volunteer something from, from my perspective. Uh, I'm coming at this from a background in satellite remote sensing which I would argue is one of the first uh, areas that really showed the world the potential of big data. Um, so for context, uh, the United States Geological Survey launched Landsat 1 back in, 19, in the 1970s, I believe it was 1974. Since then, a satellite or ones like it has been imaging the Earth, uh, so that's you know, 40 years of observation. When I started my career in 2008 as an undergraduate, I had the job of going through DVDs of individual satellite images, sitting down, you know, kind of correcting them, making sure they're right, and putting them into a bigger archive at the university for observate for uh, you know analysis. Well, in 2009, 2010, the United States uh, government decided to release all of these for free, available on the internet to everybody. In the last decade about since then, we've seen huge, op huge opportunities, huge uh, impacts from this open data, this open big data set, I should say. And we have seen increases in resilience from that. We've seen uh, monitoring of, uh, across from other satellites, we have seen monitoring of, you know, blooms of phytoplankton, which can affect fisheries. We've seen Observations of forestry and forestry loss. Uh, we can really monitor the earth. In such a way to make better decisions, uh, better decision making. Yes, I can. Sorry, I, sorry, Jeff, we were losing you a little bit. Um, do you want to try it? Just carry on again. Apologies, um, everybody. Sorry, yes, Jeff, sorry. you keep oh, going yeah. in and out. But thanks, thanks for that. Maybe I will just take one more question we have from. Um, yeah, thanks, Jeff's going to type in the chat box a little bit more. But we have a question from ISAT International, um, or a, a comment from ISAT International. We have some good examples of using data to build platforms for dialogue and along with engagement and visualization techniques, leading to investments in green infrastructure and improved cross-sector communications. Um, that's really, that's great, that's really great to hear. And I don't know, um, 
Alex or Monica or, or Angelica or Jeff, if you have some thoughts on that, I'm sure you have experience related to the use of, of data and sort of building the platforms for dialogue. Just to add to, to that comment, Dorcas is Angelica here. I think that, again, that's a great question. I, um, there's a lot of interesting initiatives and experiences that have been undertaken and have been <clears throat> systematized, sorry, by the UN uh, Global Pulse. And those initiatives include a project of using financial transactions data to measure <clears throat> economic resilience to natural disasters and in understanding movement and perceptions of migrants and refugees uh, in Europe through social media, among many other initiatives. I think that one of the key challenges with this uh, that led us to, to um, start working in this field was the lack of a uh, a robust conceptual framework though that um, really illustrated more clearly the linkages between the use of deep deep data and resilience building and again that would allow us to measure um, the impact of these initiatives on processes of resilience building so i think there's a lot of uh, projects, as I mentioned before, at the intersection of big data and development, and increasingly uh, big data for humanitarian and emergency response. What we're lacking and what we're hoping to contribute is um, to strengthen uh, measurement approaches in order precisely to have evidence of impact of the use of big data towards the ability of vulnerable systems to cope with, adapt to, and potentially transform to shocks and stressors. Thank you. Thanks, Angelica. And you know, we have we have some more great questions uh, and comments popping up here. Um, Innocent Kaba is saying there are quite a diverse range of conceptual frameworks which you've alluded to across donors and research institutions. Have you looked at the convergence of these frameworks? And you know, this may help in tying together some pieces and making them more relevant across across the board. Talking about building consistency and coherence. No, I think it's a great point and we'll definitely are looking at different uh, conceptual frameworks and approaches to resilience. And that is why it's so important for us to be part of this community of practice because there's a lot of work already being done in order to compile and systematize different frameworks and approaches and we're definitely going to build upon them. But that's an excellent point. So thank you for that. We'll definitely uh, consider that moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. This is that's very useful in terms of thinking what, how how some of the questions a group could convene around within the community of practice. This is incredibly helpful. Um, and I have another kind of comment and a point here. Indonesia is an this is from Kenneth. And Indonesia is an unusual case in that it allows access to a large amount of user information from cell phones. And the question is how applicable are some of the UN Pulse work is that outside of Indonesia? And I guess this is another question of big data applicability across different contexts. I don't know if anybody, if any of you want to address that. No, just to say very briefly, I think that's a good point and I will, I will not, um, of course I could not speak on behalf of, of uh, the UN Global Post, but I think that's a very valid point and one of the main issues right now in terms of actionability and replicability <laughs> is that big data sets and stream uh, face issues, issues of reliability and representativeness that may hamper international and external validity of findings as well. And this is like related to issues of measure. So, you know, there is a, a, a definitely a challenge in terms of how actionable and replicable are some of these approaches in other countries and in other contexts. Also taking into account that in many cases, big data sets are still restricted to the use of uh, the private sector or proprietary uses that are not, of course, open. So there's definitely issues of, of privacy and security and again, actionability and replicability. So that's, that's a very good comment. And I, I add just one point. So I'm, I'm not that familiar with the U.S. work, but certainly uh, we face challenges, particularly in a lot of the areas in which we work, in which some of these data streams are available. So that is a key challenge, uh, particularly for some of the work that we do in East Africa, for example. We tend to have access to much better data on the environmental side, given that we can draw on uh, remote sensing data sets, uh, or at least we have broader spatial coverage than we tend to have on the social side, uh, where certainly there are global surveys, like some of the work done by USAID, by 
uh, World Bank, but uh, particularly on the social side and many of countries where we work in the developing world, access to these data sets is a challenge. Uh, so I think thinking about ways in which uh, cell phone data sets could be useful in some cases Twitter, but of course these data streams tend to be much heavier, more heavily used in developed countries. So there is a lot of uh, difference in access to data depending on the region you're working in. Thank you, thank you, Alex. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start wrapping up now because we're getting close to time. But I, I'm really um, I just wanted to stop, finish with a couple of things here, and then I'll let the speakers have a have a final word. Um, I just wanted to first of all reflect that Jeffrey has come back in the chat box, and he's he's basically with this question of how do, how is this how is data helping us um, understand resilience outcomes. He's arguing that the Earth observation, which is satellite remote sensing, is a great example of big data helping to improve resilience, and that there's about 40 years of satellite data that has been informing decision making. That it became open and available online in 2009. And he's arguing that this area, the intersection of technology environment and social systems, can lead the way and serve as a model for using data. Um, and then, we, you know, we are starting to see the use of this data satellite, GIS beta, this data used in atlases like the Resilience Atlas. And now the time is to kind of integrate that culture into other areas, such as leveraging cell data and the internet of things. And in fact, one of the innovation awards that we, we just made from the community of practice is focused on, on the use of uh, mobile cell data and understanding food security dynamics. So it's definitely a space that we, we're interested in exploring further. Yes, and there are a couple of great questions here about culture, the, a cultural lens on interpreting and using big data, who's resilience and who's, who's data. These are, these are critical um, issues that I think Angelica also touched on in, in her presentation early on. What, what I will say in just, in just wrapping up is that we will reach out to, to the members of the community of practice with a follow-up around, you know, inviting you to sign up to join um, a group to discuss some of these questions further, thinking about the intersection between data, developing resilience programming and investments, monitoring them and evaluating them um, using big data. So we'll follow up with that. With that. I really thank you to Angelica and Jeff and to Monica and to Alex for, for kicking us off with this first webinar this morning. It's been really, really interesting and, and it's fantastic to see so many members of the community of practice who signed up for the webinar. I think we had over 50 people signing up. So that's, that's great too. I'm going to stop there and say thank you and just ask the speakers if they would like to, to wrap up with some reflections um, in the last couple of minutes. Sure, uh, definitely. Thank you for that. And I think these last uh, three comments in the chat box, uh, as you mentioned, I think really are key points here and something that I think moving forward we can focus on. I think trying to arrive at some kind of convergence of frameworks uh, is key and also uh, some of the points here about whose resilience and whose data. Something that uh, I really like about the RAPTA framework I mentioned earlier is it uh, acknowledges that really resilience, analyzing the resilience of the system can't be a desk analysis. It really requires uh, having close engagement uh, from the people who are part of uh, that system and who really define that system. So I think uh, understanding questions around access to data, uh, whose resilience, how is that defined, who is involved in this process are really key. So I think those are uh, inter question, interesting questions that we'd love to continue to be involved with the community of practice around. Thanks, so thanks again for the opportunity to be involved and we look forward to continuing the discussion. Yes, and on, on our part, uh, Dorcas, also to extend um, a thank you for all, to all the participants and for the community of practice for organizing this webinar series and inviting us to be the first ones of the series. I think that there's a huge, huge um, opportunity for us as resilience practitioners and researchers to really uh, go deeper into the linkages between big data and resilience measurement. I think that even though there's a lot of work that has been done at the intersection of resilience, big data, and development, there's a still much more to understand the implications of big data for uh, M&E approaches in the field of resilience, and um, including, again, the, the perspectives of ecosystems resilience. I think that we know a lot about socioeconomic 
systems and the resilience of such economic systems, but uh, we need to make a lot more effort linking what we know and what we have documented conceptually and practically with the field of ecological resilience, and which is, of course, super broad and super rich, and there's a lot being done in that regard as well. I think that the, the, the focus on big data could allow us and could provide us a new lens for strengthening those linkages and ensure that big data is not some technological, super difficult um, field, but it's actually uh, approachable and, and practical for uh, the practitioners that are working with vulnerable communities in the field. So thank you again. Thank you, everybody, and thanks, thanks to everybody who joined us today. Um, more by email uh, later today, including a link to the webinar, and we look forward to continuing to connect with you in the coming months. Um, thank you again.